My name is Mary Marshall, Dr. Mary Marshall. I'm a New Testament scholar, but I am also Director of Undergraduate Studies and Outreach here at the faculty. Um, you are very welcome to call me Mary because that is what everyone calls me here at the university, students and staff. We tend to use our first names, or with me anyway, so please feel free. I'm going to begin just with a brief rundown of what is going on at the, oh, it's the wrong slide, I do beg your pardon. And I will actually bother to show you the correct one because I think it will be useful. Um, I can't, so I will show you another day. Technical hitch. You see, it's a real university. Today, then from memory, at 10 o'clock, this presentation on theology and religion, philosophy and theology, and religion and oriental studies. If that's what you're expecting, well done, you've made it to the right place. If you were hoping that this was maths or physics, you were in the wrong place, so here is your chance to get to the presentation you mean to be at. At 11, there will be a sample lecture by Professor Alistair McGrath. Then from 12 till 2, I or another member of staff will be here, either in this room or next door, or accessible to answer any questions individually, at least for any time when I'm not grabbing a sandwich for my lunch. But there are also colleges open all over the university and they will be running events during that time too and I warmly encourage you to go to those. Also to visit the Theology and Philosophy Faculties Library. If you entered this building via the Woodstock Road you will have walked past the Faculty Library. Um, from the Woodstock Road it's the big classical building behind the fountain with the topless statue in it. It's a beautiful building and a beautiful library because it's a library, it's secure, you have to ring the bell to get in, but they are open and will welcome you with open arms and show you their shelving and show you their computer databases and you can sit in their armchairs and read their books. So there's a treat for you. So please do feel free to visit the library. If you walk through the big maths building, there will be lots of people aching to give you directions. And then at two o'clock, I will be offering a very brief presentation on making a competitive application. I cannot guarantee that you will get in, but I, what, what I can do is give you some indicators of what a successful application might look like. So that's what's going on today here in the faculty, at the faculty library. Do please make the most of those opportunities. I'd like to start by talking about why you might want to study theology and religion or philosophy and theology, religion and oriental studies. I'll try and remember to say all three, but where I say one, please bear in mind that the three probably count. It's just we, we only have till 11 o'clock. Since you are here, I, I might indeed be telling you something that you've already thought about. You, you may have already reasoned why you want to study theology and religion and have your own answers to that question. And our students have many reasons for studying. But I want to give you the two reasons that I think are really key and important reasons. Two things to take away, and they are significance and variety. So my two answers to this question, significance and variety. Let's start with significance. Now, it goes without saying that religion is a major driver of events, thought, circumstances in the world today. You cannot open a newspaper, you cannot turn on the radio, you cannot watch the news without realising what a powerful influence religious thought and religious practice remains in the world today with four billion people involved in major world religions. That's just major ones and people that we can count. So it's a major force for thought and action. So I can talk about its relevance quite easily. I can talk about the role of religion in global politics, and I've quite cheaply put some rather obvious examples here. The monks and their campaigns in, in Myanmar and Burma. The city of Jerusalem and the tensions between the three world faiths, Christianity, Jerusalem, uh, Christianity, Judaism and Islam, who consider Jerusalem to be their holy city. And President Donald Trump and where he sits on many Christian issues and the influence of religion on his politics and the politics of his proponents. 
Debates about medical and sexual ethics are very current, and a lot of those ideas are shaped by religious and theological thought and philosophical thought. But more than relevance, and it's very easy to say religion is current, it's trendy, it's going on now, it's relevant. Well, yes, it's relevant, but more important than that, it's significant. And I think significant is bigger than relevant because significant includes relevant, but is more than that. When I talk about significance, I mean it's relevant, but I also mean that it has shaped not only what's going on today, but what has happened for thousands and thousands of years. The study of theology and religion has influenced the intellectual progress and development of humanity for thousands of years. It has shaped the way that most subjects of the university are studied. It was originally the only subject to study and the first subject, subject studied at this university. Without theology and religious studies, the natural sciences would not have developed the way that they did. Mathematics would not have progressed the way that it did. Literature, history, geography would all be very different. So the study of theology and religion is not only something that we see shaping the world today, but it's something that has shaped intellectual progress, human development and civilization, and the way that academic thought is shaped all over the place. So in undertaking theology and religion, you're actually placing yourself at the heart of human intellectual endeavor. So that's quite a good thing to do. The other reason is variety. If you go and study physics, undergraduates in physics are trained to be physicists. They are trained in the scientific method, they learn to do that, they learn physics disciplines, and that's what they become. If you're an historian, you are trained in historical disciplines, you, you learn various historical and historiographical methods, and you are trained in that discipline. Theology and the study of religion has no discipline as such. There is no one theological method. We don't train theologians or students of religion so much as we train people in many different disciplines and in many different methods to study this field of study, this area of study, which has its finger, as I've said, in so many pies that has shaped so much in many different areas. So to study theology and religion or philosophy and theology or religion and oriental studies, you need to be a little bit of a philosopher or a lot of a philosopher if you're studying philosophy and theology. You need to be a little bit of a literary critic at least. You need to engage in a little bit of classics, ancient history, the classical world. An historian a linguist, if you're studying religion and oriental studies, you need to be a lot of a linguist. A sociologist, a scientist, the natural sciences, as, as you will probably find out at 11 o'clock in Professor McGrath's lecture, the natural sciences are not worlds away from what we do here. If you engage in the study of theology and religion, you're engaging the natural sciences and the social sciences like anthropology and politics and psychology. So if you come to study one of our degrees, you will actually get to do a variety of things. You'll be trained in a variety of methods. You'll get to try various things out. For that reason, I think it's actually a very helpful option for many students who, having enjoyed their GCSEs, resented having to narrow their choice to three A-levels and the things they would have to leave behind. Having enjoyed their A-levels, think, oh, am I going to have to jettison all the different subjects I've been doing and choose one? Actually, in theology, you can keep your selection of what you're doing very broad. It is, in this university at least, I think, the nearest we get to something like the study of liberal arts, a liberal arts degree. Because students do many different things, and two students in theology and religion can leave with the same degree in theology and religion from Oxford University or, or the other combined degrees, but have very different routes through the course, have studied very different things, and in very different ways. So it's a very varied and a very flexible degree. Because it's a very varied and a very flexible degree, it can also be a very valuable one when you leave. So I work for a university. I think it's important that you study for the sake of studying, that you learn that you're engaged in intellectual endeavor. 
but I'm also realistic and I know that people have to graduate from university and get on with their lives. And in, in the world beyond university, a degree in theology and religion, philosophy and theology, or religion and oriental studies is a useful tool to have in your kit. I'm going to start by talking counterintuitively about the second half of the screen. We're at university now, so let's try and think um, a different way around, approach things differently. Let's begin with the generic arts and humanities skills that you should really be getting from any degree you follow at university, and particularly a degree in the arts or humanities. Theology and religion, philosophy and theology, religion, oriental studies, foster all these skills as well. So employers will be pleased, prospective employers, that you have developed investigative, analytical and critically evaluative skills. What those words mean is you know how to find things out, you know how to tease them apart and work out how they work, and you know how to make decisions about them. Any employer is going to want you to do that. Please do come and take a seat. It's perfectly safe at the front. Um, you are also able to process complex information and identify key issues. <coughs> In a typical week of term, you may be writing one, one and a half or two essays from scratch. An essay may be two and a half thousand words. You didn't know anything about the subject you're writing on at the beginning of the week. By the end of the week, you need to have written two and a half thousand words on it and be willing to discuss it for an hour with an expert in the field. The degree requires you to take on a lot of new information very quickly, to process it, to synthesise it, to think about it, to represent it, and you're going to have to be selective. You're going to have to identify what is important for you to know, what is important for you to present, and what isn't. That's a very useful skill in life after university as well. In an arts and humanities degree, such as we offer here, it is writing intensive and there's a lot of discussion. It's a discursive form of learning. So you will learn to express your ideas clearly, both in writing and in speech. So you won't necessarily automatically uh, be placed in a situation like I'm in today, where you're talking to a lot of people in a room and there's a camera looking at you as well and you're trying to speak in full sentences and remain articulate, it's quite a challenge. But over the course of a degree, you will be developing a skill like the one I'm trying to foster myself today. You will become practiced in expressing yourself in speech, expressing yourself in writing, getting used to verbal reasoning and processing text. You will, of course, we hope, learn to hone your time and priority management skills. If you're writing two essays for two different tutors while attending your lectures, while attending your classes, let alone while you're producing a play and playing rugby, you will learn to balance all these competing demands. You'll become imaginative and creative. I'll come back to that. And you'll take a disciplined approach to problem solving. I'll come back to that too under subject specific skills. So all of these things, if you go to university and leave without these, no matter what you do, I, I think you've got a bit of a problem. But what I think theology and religion offers in addition to that is something quite special. So I've already spoken about how theology is significant and how it's relevant. And of course, you, will you would, as a graduate, be able to approach contemporary issues in politics, in ethics, in global current affairs, in a way that is informed. Fake news is not going to be something that distresses you because you are critically aware and able to determine what, what to take seriously and how to understand and how to approach and how to understand these, the, the contemporary world from a position of information and intelligence. But very importantly, I think that these degrees are some of the only undergraduate degrees that actually require a student at university, an undergraduate, to place themselves in a position which is potentially entirely at odds with their own and to attempt to appreciate and understand that position. Let me give you an example. If you are studying biblical studies, you will need to place yourself in the mind, in the context of an author living 
thousands of miles away from you and thousands of years ago, whose understanding of the world, whose understanding of society is entirely at odds with yours, but you will nevertheless need to decipher how that author's position was formed, how he thinks, why does he think what he thinks, how can you understand it, how can you make sense of it? And you will learn to do that with very distant opinions in time, in space, in culture. Many different people all over the world with different philosophical and theological positions. It is not enough to say, I don't think you're right. In order to decide, in order to be critical, you need to be sensitive. You need to understand why people think what they do. Why the world does not appear the same way to everybody. That's an enormous enormous academic and intellectual challenge. It's something that would be very neat and tidy to avoid if you could just parcel off and say, well, this is the way I see the world, so that's what I'm going to deal with, but let's forget the way that the world used to be seen, the way that it's seen somewhere else, or the person that I'm living next door to who has very different opinions from my own. No, in theology and religion, in philosophy, in the study of religion, in learning oriental languages, in learning any language, what you're doing is trying to understand through the eyes, through the ears of someone who knows the world in a very different way. It's that sensitive and informed engagement with different opinions which makes our graduates uh, very attuned to different ways of approaching situations, different ways of solving problems and different ways of understanding what they encounter. I've mentioned the variety and the interdisciplinarity of the subject. That means that whatever anybody might be looking for, whatever you might want to take up in later life, you've had an opportunity to sample doing different things. You know that you are capable of taking new things on, not least a new language. So if you're studying Oriental studies, so religion and Oriental studies, or theology and religion, um, students on both of those degrees are required to learn a language from scratch. That's a challenge. That's something that, in the UK at least, not many people do. And at least not after the age of 11. To learn a new language is a challenge. It's something new you're taking on. It's a skill that you have under your belt. But the proof of the pudding is in the eating. These are national statistics from a, a national database that we have access to and you can find online that inform us about graduate destinations for students from these, these three degrees uh, from Oxford University in the UK. Uh, you can see that within six months of graduation, these figures are taken, 95% of our graduates are in employment <coughs> or in further study or a combination of both. The database also breaks down type of work, uh, but this is quite a blunt instrument because they lump various things together. So instead of looking at the pie chart, I'm going to invite you to look at some actual alumni, as we call, it, or call them, some former students, some graduates who've left and done a variety of things. And just as there's variety in the degree, there's variety in graduate destinations, which I think is an important thing to remember. There are some things that you might want to do in later life which require you to have a specialist degree. If you have a degree in theology and religion or philosophy and theology, no one will want you to be their midwife or their dentist or their veterinary, uh, their veterinary surgeon or to build them a bridge. But apart from those very specialised fields, actually there are a range of careers that are open to you. And graduates every year go into education, law, finance, management. We have many students that go into further study, many students that go into education at all different levels. A lot of students from our, our degrees especially that go into non-governmental work and charity work and think tanks. So we see here Rachel, a solicitor, a policy advisor. Some of these quite clearly, although accurate and not necessarily representative, we don't have a lot of professional poets leaving our faculty, but we do have one, at least. So poets, comedians, ambassadors, but also uh, people going into the law, into accountancy, into hedge funds, managerial consultancy, um, think tanks, policy advisors, 
uh, a range of fields. So as with any arts and humanities degree, as with any non-occupational, non-vocational degree, graduates are highly regarded from theology and religion at Oxford and go into a variety of very successful fields. So what is it about theology and religion at Oxford? Oxford is an international university and it's an international research university. And our researchers are our teachers and our teachers are researchers and our research and our work at the cutting edge of, edges of our fields informs what we do with our students. We have a large faculty of around about 100 members who have expertise in a variety of fields, in biblical studies, in history, in study of religions, in philosophy of religions, uh, within Christianity, Judaism, Islam, Hinduism and Buddhism, a range of fields. And to give you again, to get away from the text and to just invite you to have a look at some of them, this is just a sample. And the sample is, is arbitrarily chosen in one sense in that I picked the pictures with a resolution high enough to show up on the slide. So there you see a collection of um, our faculty members, some of whom are uh, very well, well known professors who have been on the television and on Radio 4 and they engage in undergraduate teaching just as much as we have more junior colleagues who are at the cutting edges of their field engaged in very important research projects and they are also engaged in graduate teaching. On this screen the really mixed bunch of people with interests ranging from just war theory to the use of psalms in pop music, to uh, the venerable bead, to um, uh, social science in the Old Testament, medieval Judaism, just looking at some of my, my dear colleagues here and trying to remember all the amazing things that they study. We have a real diversity of students as well. We welcome students from all school backgrounds and any national background. So international students are represented here. If you are an international student and you're trying to negotiate requirements and how your qualifications match up to UK ones, do come and see me. I'm happy to talk about that. So students from all over the world, students from any kind of school, students from any subject academic background. So none of our degrees requires you to have done particular A-levels. Many people in this room may have done religious studies or philosophy and ethics or theology or divinity at A-level and you're thinking, well, that's how I know I'm interested. That's why I know it excites me. That's wonderful. Tell us about it. We love to know. But if you haven't done those subjects or you haven't had the opportunity or you didn't realise you were interested in it until you came to this talk by accident because you wanted to go to physics, but now I've changed your mind. It doesn't matter what you've studied at school. You can begin with us from scratch. We find people where they are and lead them on from there. So you can, people who study with us have studied a variety of subjects. Faith background is also not a factor in your study or in our decision to offer you a place. We have students here representing all faith backgrounds and none. Some of our students are motivated by their personal faith perspective and that becomes actually a reason for their study and part of their graduate destination. So something I should have, should have added in is that each year there are students who go on and pursue careers in ministry or ordination or within uh, religious institutions. But there are also students who are uh, very vocally atheist and secularist and that personal faith is not a motivation for their study, but they remain interested in theology, philosophy and religion. And a spectrum of everybody else in between and over the course of a degree, many people change their mind and many people change their mind about where they stand 2,000 or 3,000 times. So, <coughs> faith background, all faith backgrounds, all academic backgrounds, international students, any school background. You are welcome to apply here. We welcome students from a variety of backgrounds every year. 
One thing that Oxford does offer is the tutorial system. The tutorial system, which you're bound to hear quite a lot about over the course of today, wherever you go, because we're very proud of it, but we're proud of it for a good reason, is that our principal mode of delivering teaching here is not actually in a format like this, where you're stuck in a room listening to me talk at you for, oh, maybe 29 minutes now, well done. But rather, one or two students with an expert in their subject in a study, in an office, in a small room, discussing what they have learned for about an hour. So my students, I would set them an essay to write for me. I would guide them with some reading I thought could inform that essay. They go off, they do the reading, they think about it. That's the most important move. They write a response to the essay title I've set them. They send me their essay or they present their essay to me. And then that essay, it's not a polished, finished document. It's not something like coursework that you send off to the examiner. It's something that I use as a starting point for a conversation in tutorials. And we will have an hour long discussion about the things that they've been studying. And I'll want to know why they decided what they decided and whether I could change their mind or whether they might change my mind, which happens more frequently than you might think. And it's not only a really good opportunity for students, it's something that tutors also really enjoy. Giving tutorials is one of the favourite parts of my weeks in term. I, I really enjoy tutorial teaching and it's a marvellous opportunity for everybody concerned. College communities, I hope today you're going to get out and see some colleges, so I'm not going to tell you too much. But one thing you do need to note is that theology and religion philosophy and theology, and religion and oriental studies, and those three are treated separately in this sense, are not available at every college, but only at certain colleges, and there's a sheet next door which tells you which degrees are available at which college. That's true of several degrees in Oxford, so no matter what you end up applying for, do check uh, which college offers your course. And I hope I won't need to tell you much about the libraries because, as I say, I warmly encourage you to go and see a library in the flesh or in the, in the pages, or so in the paper, and see what it's like. The Bodleian Library, the university's library, is a copyright library. That means that for quite a long time now, anything that is published in the UK, whether that is um, Hilary Mantel's forthcoming novel, whether it is a monograph on um, the Venerable Bede, or whether it's the Beano, it has to be deposited in the Bodleian Library, which, yes, does mean that if you like, you can order up back copies of the Beano and read them, and you wouldn't be the only one that's there doing that. So we have really excellent library provision, and that's available for undergraduate students just as it is for the international scholars that come and study here. So I'll spend just a little bit of time talking about the course. And I'm going to focus on the first year of the three courses because that's the one that faces you most immediately. Uh, the three courses follow different routes. And so I'll begin with theology and religion. All students in theology and religion will study four papers that are fixed choices for you. And the idea of these four papers is that they are a, a a sample, a buffet, which lays out, which showcases the things that we offer later on. You will get to sample, we'll get to taste, we'll get to try a bit of the lots of different things that we offer so you can decide what works for you. Many students arrive at university thinking, this is the bit that's going to interest me. And it's only when they try something else that they realize, no, actually, that's what I should be doing. That's where I really excel. So all students will study a language from scratch. That could be New Testament Greek, Biblical Hebrew, Church Latin, Quranic Arabic, Pali or Sanskrit. No one expects you to know those languages before you arrive. We teach you from scratch. So one of the really lovely things is that in the first week of your study at university, while on the one hand you're writing an essay, on the figure of Jesus through the centuries and there's some very complicated stuff and you're writing a marvellous work of 2,000 words, at the same time you'll be learning the alphabet. 
That's quite refreshing. You'll have flashcards and you'll be teaching yourself to read. So you learn a language from scratch. We don't make you do that because we want to make your life difficult or we think it's good for you. We do think it's good for you, but we think it's good for you for a reason that if you're going to take seriously the study of theology and religion, to be able to engage to at least some extent the writings and the thought at the heart of those religions in their original language is a real advantage. So again, no one's expecting you to get through your first year and be fluent in Sanskrit, but to be able to understand what might be said about that language or points made with reference to Hebrew, with reference to Arabic, to equip you with those critical skills, we think is very important. There's an introduction to the study of the Bible, which is a text at the root of both Christianity and Judaism. The Bible can be studied in many, many different ways. And this paper tries to showcase not only the study of the stories of Abraham in the Old Testament or Hebrew Bible, but also the stories about Jesus in Luke's gospel. You'll learn to read from a historically critical perspective, from what is called a source critical perspective. So trying to work out where these stories came from, what might lie behind the written texts we have now read them theologically, read them from a literary critical perspective. The figure of Jesus through the centuries is a really interesting paper. Um, some of my colleagues who are more facetious than me call it Jesus forever because it looks at 2000 years of thought about this figure, Jesus of Nazareth, both within mainstream Christianity, so in the gospels, in the early church doctrines, in Reformation thought, in modern theological doctrine, but also beyond mainstream Christianity. So very much in, um, in other world religions, so the figure of Jesus in Judaism, the figure of Jesus in Islam, also the figure of Jesus in Christian mysticism, in non-canonical literature, so gospels that didn't make it into the Bible, in novels, in Dostoevsky, in Bulgakov, in Philip Pullman, in C.S. Lewis. In film, be that the masterpiece by Pasolini in black and white Italian film, The Gospel According to St. Matthew, or be that The Life of Brian. Both very worthy of your study to see just how this figure of Jesus has been used and thought about for 2000 years. And then a paper on religion and religions, which not only introduces some of this disciplinary material, learning to do the study of religion, learning different approaches. What does it mean to say religion? What is a religion? Is something a religion before we give it that label? What makes something a religion or not a religion? Is football a religion? psychological approaches to religion, anthropological approaches to religion, feminist approaches to religion, and a study of um, Hinduism, Buddhism, Islam, or Judaism. So giving you a sample of everything that's on offer. I'll come back to that one. If you are hoping to study philosophy and theology, then you will see that the theology offering half of your degree, that the first year is split into two halves. You do two choices in philosophy and two in theology, one of which is that figure of Jesus paper. And then you get to choose one of the other theology options. And in philosophy, you study an introduction to general philosophy, where you'll be thinking about um, a broad variety of theological questions learning to involve yourself in lots of uh, philosophical questions rather and lots of different philosophical conversations how do we know things what does it mean to say something is true how can we argue something what might words mean also logic logic is a form of reasoning we know what logic means in common conversation common parlance but it's also a very technical form of language that philosophers use to map out arguments in a very formal way. So learning to read logic is a bit like learning to read a language and philosophers do a class in that. Again, it's not so necessarily you go on for the rest of your life doing nothing but formal logic, but so that when you go into your second and third year, if someone talks about formal logic, you're equipped to understand what they mean. 
and also moral philosophy and John Stuart Mill. So some of you I know are probably familiar with Mill's work from, from A-level syllabus. Um, John Stuart Mill is a first year text for philosophers here. If you're studying religion and oriental studies, the theology offering makes up only one quarter of your first year and you do the religion and religions paper. That's because three quarters of your year will be given over to the intensive learning of a language. So there you do learn at a faster rate and in greater depth than the theology and religion students. And you get a wide choice of languages, which now includes Tibetan. So you choose a language and you study that from scratch and you'll study it with greater intensity and in greater depth. Going forward into the second and third year, having sampled all the things that are available, theology and religion students then have an entirely free choice of eight options, eight papers we call them, from all those different fields. Studying Christianity, Islam, Judaism, Hinduism, Buddhism, biblical studies, the history of those religions, the thought and the nature of those religions, and you are able to choose those and all of those students, all theology and religion students, write a compulsory dissertation thesis of about 10 to 12,000 words, which can be on anything you like, providing it has something to do with theology and religion, and that we are capable of supervising it and examining it within the university. But there's a lot of us and we do lots of different things. So that's not normally, not normally a barrier. Philosophers, in theology, you again have that choice of papers from any of those fields. And philosophy require you to study the philosophy of religion paper. That makes sense, doesn't it? And then will require you also to study a choice of um, Aristotle, Plato, or ethics, or a choice of modern uh, early modern philosophy, uh, people like Berkeley and Spinoza, or a study of knowledge and reality, how we know what is real. You will do eight options. You can do, you must do at least three theology and three philosophy, but you can do up to five of either, or you can make it an even split, four and four. And you may do a thesis if you wish. Oriental studies with religion, I'm sorry, that's, that's a mistake on the slide, it's religion and oriental studies. Again, you may choose freely from that theology selection, at least three papers, no more than five options. But in Oriental Studies, you specialise in a religion and you study that religion through its original language. So Buddhism, Eastern Christianity, Hinduism, Islam or Judaism, you make an in-depth study of that religion through its texts in their original languages. So there's a lot of flexibility, whichever degree you do in that second and third year, there is, there's a choice for you either to specialise in the things that really interest you that you want to become a specialist in Buddhism, so you're going to do as much Buddhism as you can, or you enjoyed the first year and dipping your toe into a bit of everything, so you want to continue doing that, and both of those options are available to you. I will be giving a, uh, another presentation at two o'clock on admissions and applications to theology and religion and the other degrees at Oxford, so I'm not going to talk about that in detail now, I will just flag up for anybody who can't make it later that, again, there's no prior subject knowledge needed. Your faith background is immaterial to the decision that we make. Um, applicants for theology and religion or for philosophy and theology are required to submit one piece of written work, which is your normal schoolwork that's been marked by your teacher. Don't write anything special. Don't send in 5,000 words, just something normal that you're doing as part of your schoolwork, but something you're proud of. Um, if you're doing religion and oriental studies, we'd like to see two pieces of writing. And applicants for philosophy and theology must register for and sit at school the, the philosophy aptitude test, which is about aptitude, not about what you know. 
And there is a test also for Oriental languages if you're doing religion and Oriental studies. The websites provide you with sample tests to look at and all the information you need. What we're really looking for is commitment to and enthusiasm for the subject and academic aptitude and our grade requirements for all three courses are three A's at A level or equivalent. If you've picked up, and may I just borrow that one for a moment, in the room next door there's a little pack that looks like this which contains lots of leaflets with lots of information that covers course content and a lot of the things that I've been talking about. Before I go on and answer any questions, uh, because you've been very patient now and listened to me for all oh, 42 minutes, um, I'd like to invite a couple of students who are here today to help us out because they are often much, much better at answering questions than I am. So I wonder whether you might like to introduce yourselves and say, um, why, why don't you begin by saying why you took up studying the course that you're studying? Okay, I'm Ellie, I'm a second year here studying theology at Worcester College and I decided to study theology because it incorporated everything I was interested in. So I'm a Christian so that was part of my decision but also my A-level choices were English literature, German history and basically theology just seemed to incorporate all of the things that I was interested in. Then, so. I'm Johnny, I'm a first year studying theology and religion at St John's College uh, and the kind of main motivation for me studying theology, well, I, was, I was kind of having an existential crisis when I applied and I, uh, my argument essentially was it's the only subject that matters, it justifies everything else and until you have an answer to the important questions in life, I mean what's the point in effect, um, that, that was slightly cynical of me but at the same time um, as, a, as a practicing Roman Catholic uh, I've got my own uh, kind of personal interest in studying religion um, but at the same time, I've got um, this balance between the fact that I've been brought up in a world where I'm told precisely what I'm supposed to think on lots of issues and being able to turn up and uh, see what other options there are, what other people think and other ways of interpreting it and then uh, kind of come to my own conclusions about things um, was a really important aspect of what I applied. Thank you. So now at this point, I'm aware that the next lecture begins at 11 and I'd like to give people a chance to stretch their legs and get a cup of tea or whatever. But uh, we have a little bit of time and I'm very happy to answer questions as are uh, Ellie and Johnny. So please, if you have a question and don't fear, it will be edited out of the tape. Do feel free to ask it. Oh, uh, it's a good question. What do we offer in comparison to Cambridge? Uh, first things first, uh, I have many good friends at Cambridge. We work very closely with them. I'm, however, I'm not qualified to talk about their degree in detail, so you'd have to ask Cambridge. One thing I would say is that whereas, and part of this question may come from a perception that's a little bit out of date now, maybe 10 or 15 years ago, our undergraduate degrees were quite different. And I think over those 15 years, actually, they've got a bit more similar and met in the middle. So actually, in terms of what the courses cover, <coughs> Oxford and Cambridge both provide opportunities to study pretty much the same material. The difference that remains between our courses and their courses are um, in how they're delivered and in how they are administered and in their structure, basically. So there are differences um, between when and how they assess people and when and how we assess people and examine people, what papers they might think are compulsory and which we might think are compulsory. And um, at Oxford, whereas you can combine degrees like philosophy and theology and like religion and oriental studies, at Cambridge they, they don't have that option, they do those things in different ways. So whereas they still have opportunities to study the same things, they arrange it in a different way. So I would have to refer you to Cambridge, but I would say, from my perspective, the differences between the courses are in their structure and the way that they are delivered and the way they're administered, rather than in what we think you should study and what they think you should study. We, we, we study very similar things and we collaborate in our research. Oh, good question. How can you get involved in theology, philosophy and everything else like that beyond lectures? Go on, have you tried this? 
I personally haven't done too much kind of outside of um, the teaching, but there's, um, there's a couple of ways, I suppose. There's um, lots of events at things like the Oxford Union, which is notorious mm. um, kind of centre for debate. Notorious is right. <laughs> it is. Um, and, uh, and so if, if you're someone who's into debating uh, kind of philosophical questions. Uh, ethical and, and politics. Uh, eth yeah. It, yeah, it's probably got more of emphasis on political, really, mm. but they'll do occasional um, uh, philosophy and theology uh, debates as well. So th there are those kinds of events going on at the university. Uh, and then there are some kind of uh, societies and groups outside of the faculty. So for example, there's a... Um, uh, I know that they have a, a termly lecture series with um, that, that's run is kind of based at St John's, doing mm -hmm. um, talks at QC House, uh, which is a more casual, informal environment, uh, kind of more for discussion rather than teaching. Mm -hmm. So th there are there are opportunities which I'm probably not pursuing as well as I should. <laughs> but uh, Ellie, you're involved yes, in the theology so society, aren't you? There's an Oxford the theology society, um, which you can get involved in. You can be on the committee for um, on the committee for that and. They host um, lectures by relatively famous philosophers and theologians and just popular characters. And, <laughs> um, and they host uh, dinners occasionally uh, where you'd have a speaker come in and then you'd have a formal dinner with them. Um, they've recently started Wine and Wisdom, which <laughs> is um, basically where we get a member of the theology faculty usually um, to do a small talk and then we just discuss things over wine. And there's a, a C.S. Lewis Society, I think, and, and a Cardinal Newman Society. So people with special interests in those two figures often pursue a, a range of extracurricular things based, based around that. So there, there are various opportunities. Um, not to mention a variety of non-university based or, or um, only part, partly independent uh, religious institutions and research centres like the Centre for Hindu Studies, the Centre for Jewish Studies, the Centre for Islamic Studies, uh, they uh, and churches across the, the university all run different kind of study groups and lecture series. So there's, Oxford is a place with a lot of things going on. More questions? Certainly. So it would still fall within the remit of the theology and religion degree, so it would have to involve theology and religion. Um, but for example, a recent student of mine wrote his thesis on um, the Christology, so the ideas about Christ that um, are found in a painting of St John of the Cross by Salvador Dali and by, um, I think it was Albrecht Dürer. So taking two pieces of art, uh, of, of art, looking at the art history implications of them and then drawing out the theological issues within those pieces. Another student of mine has studied um, T.S. Eliot um, and Midsummer Night's Dream, I think a student at Mansfield did the other year, so Shakespeare. Um, there are students that are studying politics and issues of secularism. So those, those um, <clears throat> thesis topics are really very, very diverse. And certainly um, there will be supervisors within the Faculty of Theology and Religion, but quite often I know, for example, my students studying the pieces of artwork also went to have a word with, with people in the Faculty of Fine Art in the Ruskin School just to check that they were, they were following the disciplines there in, in the correct fashion. So certainly there's this chance to combine things. You would submit that, you would submit the thesis at, at the end of your, toward the end of your third year, but you would begin thinking about it in your second year, certainly. And of the second year things that you can study, that would include um, historical papers, certainly. So there's a lot of history available in the second year. Um, and philosophy and ethics. Many of the social science-driven papers come toward the third year, though. Thank you very, very much. <laughs>